Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Leadership Project, where our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. Today, we're joined by a very special guest, and you've actually heard this guy's name before. David Morley was referenced in our great interview with Ross Nickel, where Ross was talking about his experience in building team charters for high performance teams. And he mentioned that he was leveraging the work of David in doing what he's able to do. So we're greatly honored that David has agreed to come on the show and share his own experiences today. David Morley is the founder and managing director of Ponte Valley. Ponte Valley is an organization that helps leaders manage in complex environments, particularly things around either matrix environments or in global uh, in enterprises. They help people, companies, and cultures to work better together, focusing on organizational culture and focusing on developing collaborative and winning teams in both a domestic and a global environment. So without any further ado, uh, David, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you here. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Well, first, Mick, thanks for uh, for having me on the show. I've really been enjoying the the podcasts and the, and the diversity of, um, of different ideas that are being shared. And a little bit about myself. I'm not great about talking about myself, <laughs> but um, I, um, I I do head up uh, Ponte Valley. We um, we've been around now for um, coming on seven years, and it's been a wonderful journey where we've been able to uh, essentially, I guess, bring my vision uh, to life around what good leadership looks like. Yeah, in um, in really complex uh, settings, and and I guess that goes a little bit to me, I, I suppose, around, you know, who I am and, and what I believe in. And, and, and essentially, I've always held this belief that, you know, we never need to fit into a box or into a particular way of being to be successful. And that doesn't matter whether you're a, a leader of people or just responsible for looking after yourself on a, on a daily basis. And so this idea of being eclectic and, and creating something that works for you has always been really, really important uh, for me. Uh, it probably took a while for me to to get there, but um, but yeah, I, I did, and 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 I'm really glad that that I did. So, in terms of background, just really briefly, I, I had yeah probably a pretty unorthodox start out to uh, my working life yeah to to get me to this point. You know, I um I, I left school probably disappointed my parents when I chose not to um to pursue university and um and went down the path of um of the army and or the army reserve and then some full-time service and and then of course you know along comes you know uh, your family and you think wow okay is the army the life you know for um you know for for having you know, a family and, and a younger family and and we decided well I decided probably mainly but we together we decided no that's that's probably uh, not the best thing to do. So, I um, I got a job locally, driving buses of all things, and uh, and I've got to tell you, for me in terms of my development, a bus driver is the is one of those jobs, and and whether I realised it or not at the time, it's a great leveler. On any given day, you will see people on their best day, on their worst day, on just an everyday average sort of day, but you get to encounter those people. And if you're encountering someone who's angry, you know, because they've had a really bad day, you need to make a decision in that moment around how you deal with that person in that moment. You can escalate the situation or, or you've, you've got choices. And, and I guess in that moment, I, I was making those choices to think, well, hold on, I've, I've got a person in front of me. I don't know what their day's been like. I don't want to escalate it. They're a human like me. So how do I deal with this? How do I deal with this differently? And, um, and, and I suppose over the years that I drove buses and, and I was studying HR uh, and training and development of a night at the same time, uh, I guess I was able to connect some dots between what I was learning and what I was experiencing. And, um, and, and for me, I, I always think that those days you know, where you're encountering everyone from kids to, to um, senior people having all sorts of experiences and having to deal with that was a really great proving ground for how you deal with people uh, 
every day. And then, of course, my career became one of um, moving through uh, yeah, training roles, HR generalist and training with, uh, with, with State Transit. That's who I was working with. Uh, and then working for um, for some training organisations, some wonderful training organisations like um, the Hunter Valley Training Company uh, up in uh, in the in the Hunter Valley region, uh, in training roles and pro training project type roles, uh, and then eventually heading up uh, organisational development after some time, yeah, for um for the Avis Budget Group, uh, and uh, and then beyond that, working as you know with uh, with Talus, awesome. uh, and uh, and then. Uh, yeah, the rest is um, you know, is history. And along that way, yeah, I was fortunate to to really dive into culture, studying culture, um, and uh, and people and humans, and apply my my thinking in those leadership roles. So that's that's a bit about me. That's wonderful, David. And you and I have known each other for a number of years, and I'm still learning things there that I didn't know. Uh, and I'd love to unpack a, a few of those things and, and maybe sure. potentially address some leadership lessons along the way. So mm. tell me about your army days. Um, people do think about the word leadership when they think about mm. army, but they think about very specific types of leadership. What did you learn about leadership in your army time? Well, that's, um, that's a good question. I um, probably learned, um, well, actually, there was, there was one thing, uh, well, actually, there's probably a few things, but let me start at one thing that's always stayed with me and I've pulled it out every now and then over the years. And it's the three F's, you know, firm, fair, friendly. Mm. You know, the role of a leader is to be firm, you know, and, and to, to, you know, provide the guidance, the direction and, and, and try and be as clear around all of those sorts of factors, um, fairness, you know, and, um, you know, in terms of how you view, you know, um, yeah, your situation and the people you're working with and, and the decisions you make and friendly. You know, um, you know, you need to be approachable, uh, which is maybe in the minds of some a bit counterintuitive to leadership in the military. But, you know, um, but that was one of the things that, that, that was taught to me, um, you know, in that, um, you know, in that time as a, as a key tenant and it stuck with, with me. Uh, but I suppose what it also taught me is that, and, and I suppose this was one of my first places where I started to learn more about how, how to be a leader by what not to do, you know, by observing, you know, sometimes, you know, poor leadership. It was my first real experience, real world experience of, um, of, 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 you know, e experiencing, you know, great leadership, but also leaders who potentially have, um, you know, have, uh, in, in my view now, in hindsight, perhaps not great self-esteem, not great self-confidence. And so it's easier to pull people down mm -hmm. than to, to, to elevate them. You know, and so for, for that reason, you know, creating that that culture and that way of of being around, well, you need to think like me, you need to be like me, you know, in order to, you know, in order to get by and, and started to see those in groups and out groups uh, form. And um, and so in even in those early days, I started to realize, well, the the, the people who we gravitated towards, you know, as soldiers. You know, were the leaders who were more human. It didn't matter what rank they had, but they were more human. They were prepared to involve us in discussions and decisions. They were interested in us. You know, they knew about who we were, what our circumstances were in our family, you know. So, so for that reason, you know, I, I guess, you know, back then, uh, that's when I really started to learn that, you know what, you know, the army can be a bit of a tough place. It, it, it's not always easy. But there, there were leaders who were quite human, and they were the ones that, that really made it worthwhile coming, turning up, showing up, and being a part of things. You looked forward to, you know, to that, and the camaraderie that came with those groups too. I'm hearing some really powerful words there, David. I, I really like the three Fs: so uh, to be mm. firm, to be fair, to be friendly. I'm hearing mm. the word human. I'm hearing empathy and connections, and mm. all things that we do consider universally to be attributes of of really good leaders and mm. I'll share a self-reflection here. So I was in the army for eight years as well. I was in mm. the public service in defense for five years. So 13 years in a military or military like uh, organization. And mm. if I think about um, the greatest leaders that I had in my time, uh, people like uh, general Hurley, who uh, goes mm. on to be yeah. the, the governor general and yeah, 
every one of those attributes. He he knew me very personally, like I worked in his office. He knew everything yeah. about me. He took the time, even though I was so many, uh, you know, rungs down the, the ladder below him. He took the yeah. time to really get to know me, but he was yeah. firm, he was fair and he was friendly and he made it. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about with military, mm. uh, and this one's always been one that I've uh, battled with in my own mind, is about the concept of instinctive obedience, mm. whether there is a time and a place for that. Because as I've evolved and my military days are, are well behind me without showing too much my age i now prescribe very much to the world of engagement empowerment and mm. uh, inspiring people to do things because they want to do it yeah. not because they were told to do it but certainly yeah. in that military context there is the concept of instinctive obedience as well yeah. what are your thoughts about whether there is a time and a place for instinctive obedience or whether no it should always be inspiring people to do it because they want to do it good question nick um and i i lean towards the position of i, I think it's always situational but i don't think it needs to be one or the other i, I think that if the way you describe that is is almost really nice i think because i think that the the safety net and the underlying cumulative style of leadership, if it's if it's around that engaging the greater good, getting people to to do things, you know, for for those bigger reasons, yeah, and and because they want to do it, I think that that's important. But at the same time, you know, we join an organisation, you know, for a reason, and we join an organisation understanding some of the complexities and the nuances that come with that. So if we think of defence and the military, you know, I, I think that. If, if that's our safety net is what, what, what I was just describing at the same time from an organizational, um, yeah, through the organizational lens and organizational culture lens, then, um, and, and behaviors, it makes sense that in, in a military and defense context, the instinctive behavior and, uh, sorry, discipline and, and, and obedience, all that kind of stuff has a place, uh, and has a role, uh, simply because that's the nature of the work. Uh, that, that has to happen and I, and I think that um, you know that there is a role for that it's almost like sometimes you know that is instinctive obedience I like that term um, in a way it's kind of like parenting isn't it yeah we we want to have that nurturing supportive style but occasionally there needs to be that instinctive obedience because if we don't you know then someone gets hurt exactly. you know and so so I, I think it's situational and I think it's not one or the other. I think there's room room for both. So, yeah, yeah, that's that, that, my thoughts on that. Thanks for sharing that, David. That, that was my uh, feeling as well, but I, I wanted to hear your thoughts. So uh, tell me about bus driving. Uh, what I was hearing there was being able to have the opportunity to empathise and connect and communicate with people from all walks of life. What did yeah. you learn from those years? Look, what I learned is that we're all human. You know, there's, you know, we, it, it doesn't matter how much money you have, what your job is, um, you know, whether you're doing it really tough, you know, something like, um, you know, I find that public transport is just one of those great levelers, just like any sort of transport, really. Um, it really is a great leveler. You know, you're going to be traveling with, with people from all different walks of life. But when you're in that, in that driver's seat, you know, there's um, just like all aspects of, of life, you know, you, you, you can be perceived in different ways. And, and for some people, you can be the, you're, you're the gatekeeper in a way. If someone's having a tough day and they're down by five cents on, on their fare and they really need to get to that job interview, you know, or they need to get somewhere to, to, to be with their kids or their family, um, you represent something more than just a, a bus driver. And, and I learned that very, you know, very early, early on. And, and so, from from that point of view what i learned was empathy i learned sometimes you you needed to um yeah to make decisions in the moment that that may not have absolutely stuck to the letter of the uh, the law for state transit but you know what i'm, I'm going to cut you a deal you just just get on you know um yeah yeah it's yeah it's not worth you know that yeah uh what it, you know dollar fifty or two dollars 
you know, you know, being the cause of, you know, someone, you know, not getting that job that could represent so much more or, um, you know, and of course you're not going to do it all the time, but you soon learn to, you learn a lot about trusting your own instincts. You learn about, um, you know, being able to really, it's that almost like that dynamic risk assessment, isn't it? You know, you, you, it's about really tapping into what's going on for you. What am I seeing? What am I really seeing? Is there a pattern? Is there a trend here? And, and you get to, to read people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I wasn't, good at reading people and intuitive before that yeah i, I think I, I got really good at it mm. over that um over that that period of um of time uh so so yeah uh, you learn a lot about yourself and how to read yourself uh to understand what's going on for you but also to understand yeah to, to make that connection therefore with what could be going on for someone else mm. just out of curiosity did state transit uh spend any time training bus drivers on things like emotional intelligence or conflict resolution, or is it just things that the bus drivers need to learn themselves? How, how does that come about? Uh, look, back then, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. When I came on and started, um, there, there was a bit around, um, uh, maybe a little bit around conflict resolution, but not a whole lot. Certainly no EQ, no emotional intelligence stuff at all. Um, what what was more important was understanding, you know, I guess, you know, the, the policies, the procedures around, um, around, yeah, how you do your job, but nothing, a bit of communication stuff. There was, yeah, to be fair, there was some communication, um, yeah, in there um, as well. And from memory, a bit of conflict rest, but that was a long time ago. But no, absolutely no, no EQ stuff. And and looking back, that would have been brilliant. Yeah, I was <laughs> just thinking about it. I mean, they 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 get put into pressure cooker situations sometimes. Unfortunately, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so what what inspired you at that point to decide to study at night and head in the direction of HR and organisational development? Probably. Um, the most innocuous thing i had a, another person who i was driving buses with who had shown an interest and discovered this thing called um human resources it wasn't even human resources at that point back then i think it was called um personnel and and um yeah training and development all that kind of stuff and and uh and so that's what switched me onto it and so i checked it out thought oh hold on i like the idea of this and so um and so that's um that's that's pretty much how I got into that but I loved it and it was just one of those moments in life that you think well thank goodness that um yeah that that happened and whether or not I would have got there uh, eventually I don't know uh, but it, it just it just really gelled with me right from the uh, from the outset and the organizational development piece that came over time um I I always had an interest in culture and in people and wanting to go beyond what we were seeing on the surface of things and I was fortunate, one of the organisations I didn't mention that I worked with, um, which was for me very influential, was um, was an organisation that worked in safety culture. I, I'm not sure that it's around uh, any, um, any longer, but uh, I was really fortunate to spend uh, quite a few years there really diving into and understanding, uh, I guess, you know, what does exist beyond, uh, beyond behaviour, you know, what drives our, our behaviour and and that sparked my interest in, in unconscious group dynamics, group relations. So I studied uh, for many years in the area of transactional analysis, uh, spent a lot of time um, studying in the area of um, un unconscious uh, group dynamics and was really fortunate to then be in roles like the head of OD for, um, uh, for the Avis Budget Group where I could actually bring that because I had the position of influence uh, to actually let that influence the way we built uh you know learning structures and development structures for um for the organization in this region well i for one am very grateful that you found that path in life it's interesting i'll have a personal share here that i've been connecting recently because of the leadership project with many people that have had a very positive impact on my life personally uh, i was talking to melinda muth yesterday uh, reconnecting with joy pitts uh, obviously yeah Ross Nichol, uh, yeah. Kim Hall, all of these, David Butler, all of these people that have had a real positive impact on my life. And you're one of those, David. And that resulted because you you took that path and you took an interest in, in this uh, area and, and eventually our lives collided. So I, for one, am glad that you found that discovery and uh, clearly you love it because you've stuck with it for, for all this time. For the audience at home, You've used some terms there that 
uh, they may not be as familiar with. So let's talk about transactional analysis. Can you mm. break that down for the audience in terms of what that means? Yeah, sure. Uh, so transactional analysis is, uh, and I'll call it TA for short. It's just easier. It's a mouthful. So TA is a, um, it's a, it's a theory of personality development. It's, um, uh, and really it's, it's, uh, it, it's that extension of work that was originally uh, started, you know, um, yeah, in, yeah, by Freud around the, the work of ego, uh, and um, and so the interest was taken by a guy called Eric Byrne uh, in the US back in the um, yeah the fifties and and sixties when a lot of this uh, these these different schools of um, personality development yeah really started to to flourish and and. In, in really simple terms, he he got to a point, yeah, you know, where um, yeah, you know, where he was well, he was a um, a psychiatrist, and and at one point, this is a really good way of um of bringing it to life. He um he had this job where soldiers who were injured uh, in in battle would come into the hospital, uh, would uh, recuperate, and then he would be presented with this, these soldiers and in a really short space of time had to make a diagnosis as to whether he felt that they were mentally fit and ready to, to return to service. Uh, and so he would get these soldiers present, uh, you know, they would um, uh, essentially be presenting with the white, you know, pyjamas or gowns, hospital gowns. So, so all he had to work with was what they were saying. And, and whilst he'd already been working in this space, I guess what it really crystallised for him was that sometimes he had people in front of him who were very cr critical, very parent-like, uh, very coming down on what's going on or harsh on themselves. Others who who perhaps needed to get back because they needed to rescue their, their mates. Yeah, they felt like they needed to be needed, essentially. Mm -hmm. There are others who were very childlike, yeah, perhaps very withdrawn, very compliant, maybe rebellious. Uh, and then there are others who were just on the level, yeah, rational, you know, um, able to have the conversation. And I guess, you know, what that that crystallized was was this way of thinking that within each of us, we collect our, our beliefs, our attitudes and our values in one of three ways, either in, a, in, a, in, the, in our parent ego state, in our child ego state or our adult ego state. And then naturally that influences and informs the way we, um, we communicate. And, uh, and so transactional analysis is just this wonderful, incredibly practical way uh, that's 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 evolved over all that time up till today. There's all there's just so much research and wonderful stuff out there around this, that um that just allows us to really understand where we're communicating from, what we're seeking to target in the other person. I'm seeking to target your rebellious child, you know, um, yeah. And in other words, I'm I'm being critical parent and in this moment. I I want I want to rise out of you. I want to fight, you know, or I just want you to get out of the way, shut up, and do what I what I want you to do. Okay, or I could take a different approach. I could be more nurturing, caring, supportive, okay, and approach it in a very different way, in a more healthy and constructive way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore, I'm not targeting your child. I'm actually targeting the adult in you, you know. So, so when we start to look at it through that lens, we're able to get a, a, a better sense of what's really happening when we communicate. Where, where, I'm, where am I communicating from? What am I targeting in, in the other person? And and. And there's just so many extensions of that. So in the school of transactional of analysis, you know, there is the, 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 the therapeutic field or psychotherapy field, the counseling field, the education field, and the organizational field. So I spent many years uh, studying you know, with some really great scholars uh, in, and, and practitioners in the field of the, uh, the organizational field here in Australia and, uh, and uh, in Europe uh, as well. And that led to the the um, the, the work in uh, unconscious group dynamics as well. Okay, so let's bounce onto that now. So, yeah. uh, for the audience again, un unconscious group dynamics. Can you break that down in a way that a, a leader could use that? Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, you know, we're going to be talking about engagement soon, and and the reality is, you know the unconscious group dynamics, the dynamics that are playing out in a team below the surface are often what, what, what brings us unstuck because sometimes we, we can see it, but just not know what to do with it or, or um, yeah, just know that it's happening. Sometimes we just, and, and often we don't see it. And so the dynamics um, yeah, that, that are playing out there are the sort of dynamics where 
Um, and I spoke about this recently um, as well. I was talk, talk about it all the time, but this idea, for example, of um, psychological distance. Okay, so um, if um, you know, if you're brand new to a team and you're coming into a team and you've got members of that team that are already so connected, they've been working together for so long, you know that um, that they they've already connected in such a um, in such a, a nice way that they know each other. There's a depth of resilience in that group. Um, that you could, if you wanted to, almost put a bit of a, a boundary around that group. You mm. know, it's a psychological boundary, but it's one that exists. And what that means is if I'm the new person coming in, there's a boundary that, that exists that, that I may not acknowledge, okay, that, that, that represents a challenge, yeah, because information may not naturally come out of that group mm. that has that imaginary, that psychological boundary that exists around it. Um, simply because, you know, well, hold on, who is this new person? What do we share with them? Who Do we really know who they are, what they represent, what their values are? And, and me as the newcomer, I'm, I'm trying to navigate my field. I don't know where the politics are. I don't know where the, the issues in relationships lie. And so just on, on that, in, in that way alone, as a leader, if you start to look at your team through that lens, straight away, you go, well, you know what? I just know when I've got someone new coming in, I need to find a way to ensure that that, that that boundary that's likely to pop up doesn't pop up. And if it does, it's, it's, it's a soft boundary. It's not a hard boundary. Okay. So what are the things I can do just to make that, that, that um, integration just a, a little easier? So that's just, that's, that's one way, for example, another way is when we go through change. Okay. As an organization, as a leader, if we miss the dynamics and what's really going on in, in a team, we can we can really not just um, make things harder for ourselves, but but we can we can also make things harder for our people without even realizing it. And we could have nipped it in the bud. So, for example, new change, something yeah, there's a bit of change in the wind, and when our people start to lean on us for a bit of information, yeah, and they start to ask questions. Hey, yeah, Mick, have you heard this? Mick, have you heard that? Yeah, you know, if you're missing that what you're missing is what's known as a bit of dependence. And that's the first degree of a breakdown of a team, because if we're not on task and we're not functioning, it's what's known as a basic assumption group. And that basic assumption group, you know, and the base is all about survival. The basic assumption is we need to survive. It's not spoken. So there's the unconscious group dynamic starting to come in. We don't look at each other and go, oh my goodness, we need to start surviving. We need to go into survival mode. The dynamic and the unconscious group dynamics start to kick in. And so, we, we kind of work out that, oh, okay, our, our boss isn't answering our questions, you know, can't, whether it's because he can't answer them uh, or, or doesn't want to answer them, either way, you know, we then start to break down a bit more and we then slip into, you know, the, the fight, flight, freeze mode. Mm. Okay, so some people then start to act out a bit, you know, fight to get the information. Some people go, oh, you know what, I'm just going to check out. You know, I'm just going to just do my own thing for a bit um, and uh, yeah, or maybe even leave the team and then get others who will just freeze. Yeah, because okay, I just don't know what to do with this. Then if, if the leader misses that, then the next degree of breakdown, again, this isn't spoken, is we start to pair. Okay. And this is about safety in numbers then. Okay. And that's when we start to, yeah, we, we sit in a meeting. All right. And, and this is a really easy example. We sit in a meeting. There's a group of us. Uh, someone says something. Two of us just look at each other, roll our eyes. We don't need to say anything, but we, we do. I roll my eyes. You go, oh, a bit of a nod. And then later on, we go for a walk down to a cafe, you know, and, and uh, or we catch up online later. And we, we just have a bit of a chat about that. Now, neither of us have, ex have a, a, a explicitly said that, you know, oh, I noticed you roll your eyes. We just know. Yeah, we just connect. And so there's the unconscious group dynamic. So, so this is then starting to be about pairing. It's about safety in numbers. Okay. And then we can break down even further. Okay, which is, you know, well, you know what? Screw you guys. We're all going to hell in a handbasket. It's just about me. I'm just going to look after myself. I'm just going to look out for myself. I don't care about anything else. Um, yeah, and, and uh, well, actually, that's meanness, not oneness. That's, that's about me. Oneness is when we all know that it's dysfunctional. No one actually names it or addresses it, but anyone who looks in from the outside sees a happy team. We know when to turn it on. And you will often see that when there is change and the changes around restructure, because as dysfunctional as we know it is, we also know that we need to hold on to what we've got. And so we know when to turn it on when people are looking. And yet at no time is that explicitly stated. And so there's a, a really great practical example of unconscious group dynamics right there. 
That's wonderful, David. I'm sitting there just listening to your talk and realizing that it's a, uh, a psychological explanation of the dynamics that if you stop and look, you will see them in your organizations at different times in oh, absolutely. the organization. Uh, and you are saying unconscious group dynamics, but if you stop and pause and look, and here's a challenge to the audience, think about what David just said about pairing, for example. I guarantee you that if you just stop and look for a second, you'll remember times where you've either done that or you've seen other people doing that. So these dynamics are real, but the unconscious part of it is that you're not paying attention to them or it's a bit of, can be a bit of a blind spot. Mm. Two takeaways that I then think about that are lessons that we talk a lot about on the show, David, if I can test these with you for a moment. Sure. Go back to the first thing you said about the group dynamics and the outsider coming in. I think a lot of organizations are struggling still with the concept of diversity and inclusion. And the inclusion part is that is that second part. Right? And, and yeah. we, we say here on the show that, um, that everyone deserves to be included in something bigger than themselves or to reverse it, that no one deserves to feel excluded and that feeling of exclusion is horrible. It's horrible for the person that's involved that feels like they're not in the clique or whatever the case may be. And it's not good for the organization because that person is, they're not, the topic we're going to talk about today, they're not engaged. So they're not bringing their full self to the team every day. And they're going through the emotional trauma of feeling like they're excluded. What do you see today in the world around that inclusion, exclusion, and what advice could you give to people to become more aware of it? Because you are saying this is unconscious group dynamics. Yep. What can a leader do to be more aware of inclusion and exclusion in those yep. dynamics? Well, the answer is probably easier than, than what we realize. You know, it's this, you know, the, the key to this is always path of least resistance, you know, and, and the more complex the organization and your situation, you know, it doesn't mean the more complex the, the you know, the, the answer you know, is probably, it needs to be the opposite. And my, my number one piece of advice is uh, find ways, uh, build in rituals that allow people to tell their story. You know, to be heard, to be recognised for for what they bring to the to the table. the The challenge we've got is that, in especially in the Anglo world, in cultures that are really uh, individualist, and and by that I mean it's about me, not we. So so you're it's the opposite of collectivist cultures, you know. So your collectivist cultures are you know your Asian, Middle Eastern, Eastern Europe, South American cultures. Okay, so three quarters of the world basically is is collectivist. Um, the the rest more individualist in varying degrees. Uh, but the the thing here is that, and, and this is the big trust and connection dilemma. Okay. The, the challenge here is around inclusion is, is that we in the, in the individualist world, uh, we open the door to trust based on what we do, based on competence, okay? And so what that means is, and we're also very short-term oriented, especially in Australia, in, in the Anglo cluster of countries, for example, very short-term oriented. So we, what that means is that we want to get down to business quickly. Why? Because from the unconscious, on the unconscious level, We've got this driver that we're not even aware of that says, well, I need to prove myself. So as a new employee, okay, coming into the organization, I've got to prove myself. So I need to get on task really quickly, okay? And if I, if I happen to be coming from a short term oriented country like the Anglo cluster, then that also means I need to not just get on task real quickly and prove myself, I need to do it quickly, all right? As the manager of that person, without even realizing it, uh, and, and also then we've got the organizational influence because the, if the organization is headquartered 
in an individualist country, then there will be uh, management and people uh, processes in place. Yeah, for example, if you're a leader, it might be around the 90 day plan and and really structured check ins around. OK, are you getting it? Are you, you know, prove, you know, I hate to say, but are you proving yourself? We don't use that term, but that's essentially what they are. The mechanisms to make sure that you, you're doing what we hired you to do. And so from a management perspective where, yeah, of course, we, um, we, we, we want to start the relationship on task, maybe for a couple of reasons. One, we also want to prove that, that we know what we're talking about, that we're a, a good manager. And, um, and you know, if we're short term oriented, um, yeah, we want to get down to business pretty quickly, too. So, so from that point of view, there's this, this underlying driver to get on, get on to task and, and get on with business. Now, if that's where we're starting the relationship, that's fine because yeah, that's, that's who, who, who we are culturally speaking. However, in the natural evolution of relationships, we don't start at the point of on task. The point of on task is, is middle, of the, middle of the road in terms of how we develop a relationship. We actually develop a relationship from the beginning when, you know, Mick, you don't know me, I don't know you. So before we'd, never, we, we'd even met, we were at a point of withdrawn because there was no reason for us to know each other. So our psychological distance, so let's bring that back into the mix. Our psychological distance is massive. It's huge. And it's huge because there's no need for it to be reduced. We could pass each other a hundred times on the street, go to the same cafe every day, not know each other. And the psychological distance is huge because it, it has to be, but we can also choose to be at that first stage of withdrawn. That's what it's called because we might work together, have a big disagreement. Okay. So we're on task. And in that moment go, you know, I've had enough of this. I need to check out and go back to withdrawn. So even though our psychological distance might be reduced mm. overall, we can, we can lengthen that. But then here's the thing in the natural evolution of relationships, we then go through a process of rituals and those rituals allow us to tell our story. And the deeper thing behind that, coming back to your point, is recognition. It allows for our people to feel recognized for who they are and what they bring to the table. OK, where they've been, what they've done, what their values are, all that kind of stuff. And you see, that's the resilience that we, we, we bring to a relationship right there, because ultimately we want to move beyond just being on task with, with, with our people. We, we want to get to that point of intimacy, that point of high engagement. But here's the thing. We don't just drop our barriers for anyone. We're not just going to get to that point with people we don't know. So if we start the relationship on task, that's why I say build in those rituals that allow people to, to be heard, to be acknowledged for who they are and what they bring. That's a two-way street. And as a leader, it's very unconditional because you can create those opportunities, but they may not be reciprocated. Okay. So yeah, just a, a couple of, couple of thoughts there. Yeah. I really like that. And uh, this rituals of, of allowing people to tell their story, mm -hmm. everyone wants to feel like they matter and that gives them that platform to be able to yeah. do that. So and then on top of that, you're going to break down those barriers that you're talking about uh, much faster. So yeah, really great advice. The other part then that you are touching on is about communication. And we talk mm -hmm. a lot about having open and transparent communication. And what you're talking about in the pairing, and you mentioned a leader that might be in a situation where maybe there's some things that they can't share right now, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. My experience with that is that in a vacuum of information, people will draw their own conclusions. And those conclusions may not be what you want them to be thinking. And that's where some of that uh, breakdown can come to. What advice can you give to an organization, particularly if they are going through a lot of churn, a lot of change? Mm. And there is that balance of how much do we say? How much do we communicate? Are they yeah. better to over communicate? under communicate somewhere in between what's any guidance there yeah that's 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 always an interesting one isn't it and and i think some of the variables around that is well uh, relate to the complexity of change as well um look i i think before i i give my thoughts on that i just want to qualify it with with just um uh, just an extension of what i was just talking about i was just talking about that recognition piece mm. uh you know when we communicate, what we're doing is we're offering up you know, a form of recognition you know, to, to, to another person. And we have a couple of, of key drivers or hungers, actually. We have a hunger for stimulation, 
right? It's, it's universal. We all have that hunger for, for stimulation and through stimulation, we were able to receive recognition. So if you look at it through that lens, that therefore makes, you know, adds so much more to, to this conversation because you're right, yeah, when there is change or when we have to, and often it's around change when people want information and need that information, it makes sense then that, you know, we all know that change is not something that's universally accepted or easy to, to deal with. You know, it's, it's not one of those things we, we, we all play nicely with. So for that reason, the, the, that's one of the, or that's the, the key reason why people have that, that need and that drive for information, why they'll drive, you know, I guess, you know, come up with their own conclusions around stuff because we want stimulation, we want recognition. If you're not sharing stuff with me, then I don't feel recognized that, you know, for, for my concerns, so if we look at those degrees of breakdown, you know, it, you know, if my boss doesn't get that I'm asking questions and leaning on them a bit more for, for information around what's going on and, and I'm gonna slip in down into that pairing level, then, um, then all that means is I'm not getting the recognition from my manager that I'm a bit concerned, but I'm getting the recognition from my peers who are also concerned. And so we band together, you know, through the lens of um, safety and we'll start to create our own conclusions. That's the stimulation piece. And we start to feed our own, um, our own narrative in, uh, in that way. So that probably the easiest way to turn it around is probably not always easy to do, but, but, um, but it, it will mitigate much of that is, is to find the balance with, with communicating. So even if you have nothing to update people, there's, there's probably a couple of things. There's your overall approach and demeanor to it. So if you have an approach which is generally quite open uh, and communicative and approachable, then first of all, that will contribute to the bigger picture around this. And then secondly, you know, as you have stuff that you can share, do that. And, and I think be transparent and say, look, yo, there is stuff that's bubbling away in the background. I, I can't share it with you just yet. Um, but, you know, you know me, you know, and if you've got that, that, that buildup of trust, if you've moved through those stages of recognition, that rapport building the recognition into a, a stage of momentum in your relationship, what generally tends to come with that you know, at a team level is a measure of trust because we know each other well enough that if Dave is saying this, then we trust him, okay? And we'll cut him a bit of slack because we've got the other stuff that, that, that fits that picture around Dave, yeah, because he might be consistent. He generally delivers on what he says. He hasn't really let us down before. Uh, so, so, okay, um, if he says, look, he, he's got stuff there, he's aware of stuff, but he can't share it yet, that's fine, but we trust that he will when he can. So, so I think it's not just about what we communicate. I think it's also about that bigger picture around you know, who we are and our approach and our demeanor in, in that way. Yeah, some interesting takeaways there, David. And, and I think a, a key point there is about sometimes it may be getting the team together and say, look, yeah, there's nothing that we can share right now. And, and no update is still an update in yeah. some respects. Whereas if you say nothing, then they start drawing their own conclusions as as I was saying. <music>